Yesterday I saw the full episode of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling Impact. Actually, it's called Impact Wrestling now. I know it's three years old and I made that mace mistake. I'm such an asshole. But I saw the opening match with Abyss and Eric Young and me and my little bro were riffing on this show since my little brother hates TNA. He completely disrespects it, disregards it as having no potential. The match was a spot fest, an entertaining spot fest at that. I like the Abyss character and how it's supposed to be a McFoley meets Kane kind of character. And this storyline sums it up because once Eric Young wins, and, well, actually, Abyss wins, but Eric Young takes off his mask, and Abyss realizes that he is Joseph Park. And my bro was kind of, we were both analyzing this and joking about it. How do you not know that you're your utter gimmick? How does that surprise you? How does, let's say, Christopher Daniels not realize he's the curry man? And that's that other match. Uh, the curry man jobs out to Bully Ray, and he jobs out pretty hard. It's a monsters ball mess match, and uh, the dude gets squash. He gets put in that coffin after a spike pile driver, and then Bully Ray looks at the camera, trying to send a message to that Anderson guy, Ken Anderson, Mr. Anderson, no, Mr. Kennedy from WWE. I'm going to end your career. Some corny shit like that. And then he closes the casket. It was a really quick squash. But I like the fact that the curry man comes back for no fucking reason. Just to get squashed by that guy. We don't even see a northern light suplex from him. The guy gets squashed quickly. Um, you get to see a lot of MVP and some backstage segments. Actually, I'm going to stop and talk about the backstage segments. I mean, MVP shows up in the front, and he basically says, he books Kurt Angle versus Magnus in a non-title match, and he says that TNA has a large international fan base. It has great talent, yet it's ruined by mismanagement. Which he's absolutely right on, and he basically goes out to say, I want to make sure that's all rectified. He even acknowledges the loss of AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, and other talents, which I have, well, Jeff Hardy was in loss, but he got screwed over in the Magnus title hunt. I have a lot of respect for that because AJ Styles is gone, and TNA still acknowledges him. The WWE doesn't do shit. The WWE always crisp and waws characters. CM Punk, they just crisp and waw to him. They don't acknowledge the fact that he ever existed. And they do this so many times. They have to keep crisp and wawing characters. It's absolutely ludicrous, but it is what it is with the WWE. There was another backstage segment where because there's been like three backstage segments with MVP and regarding MVP and they're all entertaining to look at despite the fact that the camera guys are just doing the shaky cam thing way too hard this isn't Cloverfield this isn't what's that horror film? The Blair Witch Project. You don't need to do all that shaky cam shit. It's not really necessary. Now, I like the fact that there's continuity and that they acknowledge the fact that the cameraman exists that way. It's not like the WWE where 
the cameraman will be there and I'll just act like nothing's going on. I'll talk to the other person like the audience isn't watching. And it gets ridiculous with the dream sequence that happened in 2010 with Vicky Guerrero pretending to faint, faking that. And all this other bullshit. It's Mad Ed. Acknowledge the cameraman. He plays a role in the scenario. And he forces continuity upon... The show. Upon the talent. Upon the writers. But anyway, Chris Tahim and her boyfriend... Boyfriend turns out to be a creepy psycho. I mean... He has a room full of all these girly things like a mannequin with a wig, some pictures of girls in the back, and it's kind of like a shrine in a way. And that freaked her out, and they spoke about that. Yet, <laughs> I like the psycho gimmick. I don't know if that's good for that character. Maybe he deserves a better treatment, but... I'm kind of liking it, it's hot. I will admit I got a boner. Hopefully, he fucks her on camera. And... Chris Sabin... has a backstage segment, and I spoke about this in my... in an open Facebook group, uh, no DQ actually. Last week, I didn't see last week's episode of Impact, but last week, Velvet Sky dumps Chris Sabin because of the bullshit they've been dealing with back and forth. This week, Chris Sabin says some Drake ass shit. This is the place where me and Velvet Sky had her first kiss. And then he pops a question to her, and she gets like, you know, and then he. She opens it up, and there's no ring, and he's like, gotcha, bitch. Now, when I won the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, everyone was talking about, what's up with you and Velvet Sky? How's your girlfriend? They were talking about me as a title. I want to prove to the world that in this couple, I was the bigger star. And if you don't dump me, I dump you, it's over. He said that, but the guy has no charisma. Half these TNA originals can't say shit for shit. And I was still feeling that because, like, in the beginning, I was like, yo, what are you doing? That's, like, the most great thing in the world. But after he said that, I thought, damn, Edge could have said that much better. But I was feeling that. Could you imagine Edge saying some bullshit like that to a Vicky Guerrero or a Lita? Not even funny how good that would be. But... That, I thought, kind of made things make less sense, because you have a situation where she totally re she totally curves his ass, but as soon as he brings a ring out, all of a sudden, that beta shit gets to her. As soon as he brings a ring out and proposes, or, you know, the case for the ring, the ring wasn't actually in there, she should have just been like, Ew, no, like how a girl would usually act. Because, in all honesty, that's some beta shit right there, what he was saying. So there's no... That's why I hate about these wrestling storylines. They take away realism because that is a live scenario where the wrestler is beta as shit. He's not that dominant so that he could get away with it. But it's still effective. So it just makes the whole scenario look more uncanny. You know, uncanny valley up in this bitch. But... What's there left to speak about? Magnus versus... Uh, Bobby Roode? That was the main event of this match, and... 
No, not Magnus versus Bobby Roode. Samoa Joe versus Bobby Roode. That's what it meant to say. And that match was actually pretty good as a main event. I actually enjoyed it. Even though Samoa Joe doesn't nearly do as much as he used to in the ring. He still brings a lot to the table. That muscle buster finisher. Me and my bro agree. We don't see that a lot nowadays in professional wrestling. Actually, we don't see that at all. So he brings that to the table. He's an agile guy. He's unique in the ring. And Bobby Roode is an interesting in-ring presence. He's an awesome character. I like the in-ring storyline here where... Bobby Roode kept trying to lift Samoa Joe for no fucking reason. Like, why are you doing that? Switch up your tactics. Do some heel shit. But no, Samoa Joe wins the title, so you're gonna face Magnus for that shit. Kurt Angle versus Magnus, on the other hand. That was a little boring. I'm gonna be honest, I was not entertained. It didn't last too long. That's a good thing. We could riff over some of the details of the match and of previous events while that was going on. So it had that going for it. Kurt Angle put Magnus over the ankle lock a couple of times. I don't know who left winning this match, and I don't really care. Another match I forgot about was, and this was actually my favorite, this is the last thing I want to talk about, which is Austin Aries versus Zima Ion. This was my favorite match because I love Austin Aries. He's the only reason I watch TNA at the moment, but Austin Aries is an awesome guy. He cut a promo about the fact that he was the first ex he was the first guy to use Plan C, and Plan C is basically when you cash in your X Division title. Yeah, I want you to hear those farts right there. That's me exuding my dominance. He, when you cash in your X Division title around June so that you can get a world title shot. That's what it is. And he invented that. That was his concept. Zima, Ion, his uh, bromance crew come shows up, and basically Austin calls them Guidos and tells them to get the fuck out. But Zion, Ion, Zima, Ion comes from the back, assaults him with the briefcase. They're taking the money in the bank idea. And cashes in and he tries to pin him four times, gets fucked up, gets put out for brain buster. That's the end of the match. Doesn't get more complicated than that. I did oversimplify it, but whatever. If you're gonna pin a guy two times consecutively and it doesn't work, why pin him four times consecutively? It's not gonna work, dude. You need to get your weight up, bro. But, I'm curious about that, because if they took the idea of a Money in the Bank briefcase, but only applied it for the X Division title, and they already fucked up with it, because they didn't make it work for a very long time. I, this is an early attempt, and it already failed. What should the WWE do? in terms of the Intercontinental or U.S. title. If that title gets unified, should they have a Plan C rule with the mid-card title? You'd be like, okay, I'm dropping my IC title for a shot at the World Heavyweight shit at SummerSlam. Can they do that? Or would that make the IC title look shitty? And I think it would make it look shitty, because the IC title is the worker's title. It's not just a mid-card title, it's a title for the person that works the hardest in the company. It's their, you're busting your ass, so here's your title thing. It's not the world title. 
it's not the title for the guy that draws the most, the guy that represents the world, it's the guy that really is the workhorse, the company icon, really. This is my thoughts on TNA, and hope you enjoyed this video, because you know I sure as hell didn't. This is Mr. Rocket 7, and suck my dick.